All right, let me come straight to the point. So we have uh, absolutely no idea what's going on out there. So, you know, you heard uh, last days all about AI, what it will do to the future of humanity. You have been discussing algorithms, opportunities, and stuff you could do. Um, you know, truth is that a lot of the algorithmic framework of AI, apart maybe from deep learning, uh, deep mind, which came uh, over the last uh, years, really, a lot of that has been out there for a very long time and has been deployed well before most of you were born, okay? So it's out there, industry uses algorithms and uh, AI optimization, machine learning, classification, anything you can think of for a very, very long time. Now in London, you know, I don't know any financial institution which, is, which isn't using artificial intelligence on their trading algorithms, yeah, right? So speed trading, uh, anything which works on speed, complexity, huge volumes requires essentially machine machines to take decisions very quickly. Now, there's not a single company doing this. There's a second company, a third company, a fourth, a tenth, and hundreds, a millionth company. So thousands of companies using AI, uh, betting against each other, and suddenly you are in an ecosystem where a lot of self-dynamics, cognitive behaviors are happening, where we just have no clue what's really, really going on. We don't know. Right? We really don't know. And I think that's one of our biggest conundrums. Um, we call it the observation platform conundrum. We just don't, we don't have a platform to see if AI is already active, if it has any form of impact on humanity today. We just don't know. And uh, I'm not sure you know this film. Does anybody know that film? It's uh, Battlestar Galactica. I'm not sure you've heard of that one. So it's a, uh, a sci-fi uh, which essentially deals with that coexistence human machines. And uh, the machines in that film have coexisted with the humans for about uh, two or three decades. And the humans haven't realized because they lacked that platform of observation. Uh, one third of the people on, or the creatures on that picture here are machines, right? Machines tried very hard and uh, coexistence didn't work out and it went to an all-fledged war which then ended up in 30 series in Netflix, right? So if you want to see that, uh, it's a film interesting watching if you're into AI. The point I'm making here is, is that we, re we don't know. It's, we lack this observation today, the same as in that film, uh, if there's any AI active already today. We know that financial markets have huge impact on humanity. We can't argue that, right? It, uh, it stimulates growth stimulates prosperity, it stimulates war, it stimulates uh, conflict. A lot of stuff is related to the financial markets. You also agree, and you heard about this yesterday, that financial markets are driven by AI. Which guarantee do we have today that actually some of the AIs are playing against each other in one way or another, which is a secondary effect, essentially, leads on to larger conflicts which we cannot control. Truth is, we don't know. We lack this platform. We have the platform for various things to observe things, right? So I can see you here. I know you're here because of my platform, my eyes. Uh, when we started to explore uh, stuff we couldn't see with the eyes, we built microscopes. The microscope is a great platform to observe things we couldn't see with the eye. Uh, we started to build other things, a telescope. Uh, we started to build antennas to see radio frequencies we can't see. We have these platform observation for a lot of stuff. For AI, we don't. We simply don't. Right? So, and that brings us to the next thing is that, you know, these financial algorithms are not actually built to create havoc. They're actually trained to maximize uh, returns. Now, what could happen is this, I'm not sure you discussed that yesterday, I wasn't here, is uh, what we call the paperclip conundrum, right? So, uh, you know, my colleagues in Oxford 2013, when I talked about singularity, they, they gave a very simple example, and I really like that example because it's a very simple one to understand. The machines in 2045, 2050 uh, are instructed to do something great for humanity and provide to every single human on planet Earth a paper clip or enough paper clips so they can handle the admin. It's a really, really nice and, uh, you know, almost charitable goal. Okay, so the Uber AI engine goes on doing that about achieving this goal. At some point, the uh, AI engine realizes there are too many humans on planet Earth to actually build enough paper clips. What does it do? Slowly and indirectly, it starts eliminating humans. Okay, not killing directly, but eliminating them. So it essentially diminishes the population of uh, the human race until 
it can serve everyone with enough paper clips. Do you see the problem? It's the butterfly effect of artificial intelligence, right? You start with something really nice, there's an Uber engine, has certain control of certain things, ends up in a situation like this. Can we trust AI? Don't know, I ask you. Well, you can, yes or no, right? And that's the Tesla conundrum. Yes or no, you can trust AI um, as long as it's not touching my own life, right? It's the uh, typical thing which happens. Let me ask you, I, I ask this question almost in every single keynote when you're talking about a topic. Let me, let me query you. Who of you, if a Tesla was parked out here, right, would actually, or let me do it differently, if a Tesla was parked in front of your home, okay, who of you would put your kids into the car and have them been driven to school 10 kilometers, 50 miles per hour through a really busy and complicated city uh, take any city in Italy. In fact, it does the job, right? And uh, who of you would do it? Assume you have a good relationship with your kids, okay? And if you don't have kids, uh, uh, <laughs> if you don't have kids, uh, uh, just imagine yourself. I want an honest answer, right? So I don't want this to... No, no. You have it now. Tesla works now. AI works here. Who would do it? Hands up. Uh -huh. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> All right, so with kids, we don't, mother-in-law, who would do it? <laughs> you see the problem, right? So I asked that very same question about a year ago in Los Angeles in front of 4,000 uh, engineers. Everybody in the Valley is designing algorithms for these type of applications. 10 hands went up. 4,000 people are designing that. 10 hands go up, right? So it's all good. We all love it as long as we don't have to use it. Okay, that's one of the uh, most fundamental problems we have essentially today, and that's the adoption of that technology. Um, so, and that's really what the situation is. So for some applications, it's okay to use AI today, even if it fails. If it fails in 1% of the cases, we don't care, right? If my algorithm detects whether there's a cat on the picture or a horse, or whether my Amazon uh, uh, Alexa just screws up a single conversation, it doesn't make a difference. Right, 1% outage is okay. But there's a lot of stuff out there where 1% outage is not okay. Not okay at all, right? So I gave you the Tesla example. We can't have 1% accident failure on planet Earth, wouldn't work. We can't have autonomous robotics relying on AI building uh, uh, drilling rigs. We can't do uh, NASA rover uh, mission type of stuff. We can't do optimization of your traffic patterns in a city like London using AI if in 1% of the cases it fails and accidents happen. Do you understand that, right? So there, there are two worlds here. There's the world we can address today with all the AI we have, and there's a world we cannot, right? We need to know what's going on there. What's wrong if something goes wrong, and why is it wrong, right? So, and uh, the, the uh, European Commission actually recognized that, and they came out with legislation which will totally change the face of AI. In fact, all AI you have known until today will be mostly useless as of 25th of May, 2018. 10 days. You got 10 days to use the AI you have been using. Let me go to the GDPR Article 13. Read it, right? What does it say? The controller shall provide the existence of automated decision making, including meaningful information about the logic involved, okay, as well as after sign significance and visage consequence of such proceeding for the data subject, right? So, in essence, if you're a consumer-facing business, B2, B2C or B2B2C, and you're using AI, and you're taking certain decisions, and somebody brings you to court uh, about these decisions, you need to be able to explain why a certain decision has been taken. Can you do that today with the AI you have? Convolutional codes, deep learning? You can't, it's a black box. Input, black box, output. You don't even have a, a track record of what happened to your black box uh, a month or a year ago. So you cannot. Do you, do you see that? Do you see the gravity of the situation, right? So the GDPR does not allow you to continue your AI as you have it today. That's number one. As of January 2018, as a result of all the financial manipulations and the uh, evidence that AI had an impact on the financial markets, there's this law on markets and financial instru instruments directive which says, requires operators of automated decision-making algorithms to provide human understandable justification for automated uh, decisions. 
Okay? So here you go. That is what you have as of 2018 to deal with. It's all good what we have been doing at universities and uh, other stuff in the past. Now it's getting real, and the landscape is changing significantly. Okay? So, and why was the uh, European Commission so, so itchy about it? Because of that, right? So if you, because AI is uh, sometimes really, uh, you know, AI freaks out. Or AI is sometimes really freaky. Look at the examples, top left, financial markets, right? Sometimes stuff happens which you just don't understand. Suddenly you have a crisis which hasn't been caused by humans, by anything, but just by some AI and just doing some funny things. You have Tesla, accidents happen, right? We all understand as engineers that the amount of accidents is much lower compared to human driving. But there is a, a price to pay because for every time you want to improve the Tesla algorithm, somebody has to die, okay? That's the economy of Tesla. Every time you want to improve the algorithms, really, somebody has to die. You improve it, all the Teslas are being upgraded. It's different to us human drivers, but it's very different to us human drivers because when we drive, nobody has to die, really, right? So that's one of the conundrums there. That's why we want to understand what's going on. What else? This one here, chatbots. So this is a freaky part, so the lower part is a freaky part. Chatbots, I'm not sure you talked about this yesterday. There's a, there's a really fascinating a uh, video on, on YouTube where two chat box talk to each other. Have you ever seen this one? It starts really nicely. And after five, six minutes, after five minutes they're flirting, after six minutes they talk about sex. Right? This is freaky. What happened here? It's just having a normal conversation, start off getting to know each other after five minutes. This gets really freaky. Look it up. Uh, I just want to explain you a little bit where we are today with the methodologies. I don't go into a lot of maths and all the design stuff we're doing, um, so don't be afraid of that. But that's essentially how we all started. It's machine learning. Let's take the example of a cat so it doesn't freak anybody out. So the algorithm is supposed to say there's a cat really on the picture. So we'd start using classification, would be trained essentially across loads of cat pictures, which we humans have labeled. Uh, the algorithms would learn and then would be able to say, yes, you know what, Th on that picture, we have a cat. Right Now, um, we evolved that because we wanted more than that. We wanted what we call explainable AI, where the algorithm is essentially would tell us why it is a cut, right? And uh, you would want to know where exactly the decision has been taken. So we started to build these deep neural networks with different layers. So this is a cat, says the algorithm, because it has fur, whiskers, and paws, and the decisions have been taken uh, somewhere in the chain on the run, right? So we're still not able to reverse engineer that, but we're at least able to pinpoint where certain decisions have been taken. We're not able to say why certain decisions have been taken, right? So what we are pioneering at the moment in Kings is this explainable AI planning. So it's been done by uh, Dan Magazzani. It's a theory which is now five, six years old, so it's not new. It's been used uh, NASA, Schlumberger, uh, Heathrow, Transport for London, and... Um, and a few other companies, well, I'm one I'll tell you in a moment, right? So this is industry-grade AI happening right now, which is addressing the problem of exactly that 1%, right? So this algorithm, is, this algorithm may go wrong, but when it goes wrong, I know why it goes wrong and where it has gone wrong. I have traceability, I have accountability. It does not act as a black box. It works on state spaces. Imagine, you know, I can do loads of different things how I move my hand, right? So every way I move my hand, I put this as an output. The way I could get there is virtually an infinite amount of state spaces, how I could transit mathematically. Now, nobody knew how to do that in the past, so what we did is we compressed it, convoluted, and we ended up with these deep learning algorithms here, which are much more compact, but act as a black box, right? So we span it out again, and we found algorithms to address that state space problem, and we're finding close to optimum decisions in that state space, so the machine isn't rational, but it is uh, very intelligent. 
gives you a very good solution, right? So let me have a look if I get it. And the other good thing is, is we can bind in humans. So humans don't get freaked out about it because suddenly the machine starts to take input from the human being uh, and starts actually adapting the state space depending on what the human is actually saying. So this is a cat because it has fur and whiskers, right? That's what my algorithm says, and I know where it says it and why. And because he told me it has paws, so there's a human saying, hey, you know what, there's paws here. So that's why, uh, and I've made the decision at state X, Y, Z, okay? So we're currently totally changing the landscape here. Again, this is a methodology which will not give us uh, um, uh, purpose to machines or, or uh, any, any type of uh, super creativity, but it's there to address that 1% problem. Right? Do you understand that? And that's important. I think that's the roadmap to go for anything which is uh, on the commercial roadmap. Right? So this is all right for your Alexa. That needs to be done if you want to go out and make money out of that. Okay? So this is really the roadmap. Who is using that today? Um, so we have a company series. I'm actually co-founder of that company. Uh, we founded it together with uh, David Willits, a former minister for science innovation. It's a satellite company. So we're launching 46, uh, 48 satellites, LEO satellites for uh, Earth observation within 32 and plus minus, uh, plus minus 32 latitude, essentially revisit times every five minutes, almost like a uh, real-time picture. It's against uh, piracy, legal fishing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So what we have is we have our satellites in space. They're being controlled here. They're sending data down to our control centers, and we have developed a whole uh, neural network-based AI to do image processing. It works really well. Okay, so we can say with a very high reliability, there's a ship here, there's some piracy happening here, there's some illegal stuff happening here, so it's pretty good. Now, but that doesn't get us anywhere because you need to actually interact with the control center. So you have operational control centers, which are the National Coast Guard, uh, you know, which are essentially people responsible for the uh, uh, national security of a country. So what you really want is that the people sit in here could use AI now to deal with this huge amount of extra data coming in. But that needs to be AI which with which they can communicate, AI which they can trust. AI, when it does a decision and it screws up, we know why it screwed up, right? Because these are problems of national gravity. So therefore, we are using currently a mixture of both the traditional deep learning AI very successfully, and then when it comes to the human interaction in a very serious business, we talk about, we use the explainable AI. Uh, wh where else do we use it? We're designing a next generation internet, which uh, I call the internet of skills, which essentially allows you to democratize skills and uh, transmit any skill you have, whether you, you want to teach somebody how to play the piano, or somebody teaches me how to paint, or you want to do some surgery, or you want to do some uh, colonoscopy, as in this example here, uh, or anything else. You want to repair an engine, uh, Vauxhall, or BMW, right? So couldn't we use and transmit essentially human skills? Well, there you need exactly a combination of 5G, robotics, soft robotics, and AI. So we have a very big project right now in China where we help with the calling cancer detection rate in rural China, which is very poor. It's very poor not because they don't have good doctors, but the good doctors want to live in the capitals like Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. Uh, same problem we have in Italy, same problem we have in, in the UK, anywhere else on the planet, right? So the ability to essentially have a high, high skilled doctor in Beijing do a remote um, kind of diagnosis on a patient using 5G and AI to stabilize the system uh, would make a huge difference to the ecosystem. So we're currently designing that and that's being deployed in China. Um, coming to the end, so talking a little bit about the, the future, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time on that, uh, but I brought up this slide here. and. Um, on purpose, right? So the Olympics, and the, the reason I brought up the Olympics is, is because the, the Olympics actually were the first place where uh, human and machine uh, were natively, symbiotically working together to compete on the Paralympics, right? Not the Olympics, but the Paralympics, right? So it were really machines were there to help the human being to become a better a more competitive human being. So, and uh, I, I think, you know, the Olympics maybe in 100 years time will arguably be the only place where uh, humans will actually compete, like true humans, without machines, right? 
Forget about the doping which happened in the last years, right? But um, so I think that's really interesting, right? The Olympics were the ones which really start with a symbiosis, machine human, and possibly ends up being the only place in 100 years' time where humans will essentially be true humans and compete on without any machine help, right? But anyway, I think we need a lot of symbiosis. We need co-living. Uh, machines are coming. Um, you know, they have limits, and uh, limits maybe are shown in this picture here. So, and I'm sure you have talked about this yesterday. And, uh, you know, I like to summarize the limit of AI in a very simple term. So, machines and AI, um, they can visualize, okay? But they cannot imagine. Okay, so what humans can do, they can imagine. Uh, AI can visualize. So me as a musician and composer, I freak out a lot about AI composing music. And indeed, you know, I look a lot what Google, is, Google DeepMind is doing. Uh, they have two, two projects on there, really interesting. Fortunately, the music which comes out there is really shit, okay? And the reason it isn't, it isn't good, just like this picture is, is because it is a superposition of anything human fed into the engines, right? So they're trained to work on a known classification set. Uh, so they do loads of, you know, superpositions, but they're not able to create the Gaudis, the Leonardos, the Mozarts, right? Not yet. We need other algorithms on that. And with Demis, we're talking a lot about this. But for the time being, machines, I think, are very good in visualizing, very good, right? So we can come up with new art form or kind of a derivative art forms, but it cannot imagine, not what we have. This purpose of being very creative is something which is still eluding the, the machine world. But the opportunities, right? So let me just finish off with this one. And, um, you know, people talk always about increase of productivity and all that. I see a totally different opportunity here. And that is just that humans come back to what we're humans really good at, right? So being creative. And uh, I like to say, uh, some, uh, you know, I took this quote from somebody, we should use really AI to automate jobs and uh, humanize work. That's really what we should do, right? Think about, think about it, maybe in the break you should do it. Uh, take a typical day of last week. How much time have you spent on some shitty admin? on some really silly stuff which some, somehow uh, an AI algorithm could have done much quicker and much more efficient. So you could have spent much more time on what you're really good at as a human being, being creative, a human fellow being with a human fellow, right? And that is, I think, the huge opportunity. Use it, embrace it, uh, use it as essentially uh, to automate the jobs and humanize work. And um, if we really want to go about it, I think we need to solve three things. I'm going to finish with that. First one, of course, is the legislation. And I think, you know, Pro, you talked about this yesterday. I don't believe in soft legislation when it comes to difficult things like these. Uh, like privacy is a soft legislation, just to tell you what is hard and soft legislation. Privacy is uh, soft legislation. We have asked the companies like Google, Facebook to kindly respect the privacy of the people, okay? Where security is something which is hard encoded in the engineering design, right? So we cannot transmit a packet over the internet unless it's encrypted, but I can transmit a packet today over the internet which exposes all my private information because we just don't know what the big guys like Google and Facebook are doing, right? So, and with AI, machine coexistence, etc., I think we need more hard legislation. Certain things can only happen if certain conditions are uh, met. Uh, something else is on the taxations. It's been, uh, um, um, I'm, not I'm not sure you've talked about this yesterday, but the idea of taxing essentially um, robots because they're increasing the productivity, I think is a great idea. And if you think about it, the FTSE 100 companies have an average um, income per employee of half a million dollars, okay? FTSE 100 average is half a million dollars. Now, some, some of the people in the FTSE 100 are essentially employees are getting part of that $500,000, but the majority is on a $50,000 salary, right? So somebody is pu putting a factor 10 in their pack pocket, right? That's what's happening in the FTSE 100 companies. Now, when the robots kick in, that t factor 10 will probably go to a factor 20, 50, 100 possibly, 
right? So there's no harm in taxing essentially an increase in productivity due to machines and feed it straight back into society. And interestingly, you know, this notion of us uh, needing to work to be a fulfilled human came from our dear friend Karl Marx. Before the times of Marx, it was okay not to work, right? 20% uh, of the population before Marx's time were maintaining the rest of the human population. And if you ask a big, uh, big uh, like Cisco, the CEO of Cisco was asked about 10 years ago, how many people do you really need to run Cisco? Okay, uh, out of 100,000 workforce, he said four. Four people, right? So in other words, you know, I think we have a lot of opportunities to step back uh, and really humanize uh, work, hopefully. So I'll leave you with that. Um, visit me in London. That's the view of my office. I'm in Bush House. Uh, we deal marginally with that topic. I'm really trying to build this next generation in it of which AI is a very big constituent. And of course, the guys in this building here are discussing it almost every week, which is why I'm spending a lot of time uh, giving evidence, right? So that's it from my end. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thanks, Misha. Um, before you sit down, explainable AI, um, when, how do you know when you need to implement explainable AI? I mean, you mentioned regulatory situations, yeah. MIFID, for instance. Yeah. Okay, we, we'd better do that. But um, what are the characteristics where you know, rather than just you know, plugging it in and letting it run, say, let's see what happens, I actually need to know what the outputs are and why they're happening. When do I need to do that? Well, my, my answer to that is that Truthfully, anything you do, from, you do from today onwards, you should start looking into explainable AI. You need to be able to explain what's going on in the black box. Um, if you're able to do it on your current framework, that's fine. We, you know, we're developing another framework because we're not able to do that on that framework. So yeah, my recommendation is start with it today really, on all of it, because it will be a requirement on anything which will happen because of the butterfly effect, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe later I'd love to have a conversation about the future of work with you, uh, things like universal basic income yeah, and, yeah. and other things that are flying around. And I haven't uh, even made my own mind up yet about taxing robots or the use of uh, robotics and AI. So I'd love to have that conversation with Let's you. Let's do it. Great. So, Misha, thanks again. Cheers.